Um, I may have a baby face, but, but I have a lot of experience in this business. Um, and, and I'm very happy and very humble that I'm here today to share it with you all. Um, so just get right into it. To date, we've closed over, we've closed 24 deals. We are actually working on our 25th one today to close any day now. So that would be a huge milestone for us. As you can see, we've utilized all forms of the alphabet soup of um, um, trans, you know, um, tools that are out there, whether it's LightTech and NMTC and Historics and obviously um, four and nine percent taxes and bonds and everything in between. Uh, so far, we've done um, slightly over seven hundred and eighty million dollars in transactions, which have amounted to about twenty-three hundred or so units finance developed to date. Um, we'll skip that slide. I think the thing that I'm most proud of is the fact that we are able to interact with for-profit, non-profit religious and public institutions throughout our entire career. We've worked with private owners to help them um, extract value with their land, and we've done the same thing for private owners. We're currently working with a couple of religious institutions right now, and <clears throat> to date we have under construction 179 units in D.C. With the, uh, with the deltas. Any, any deltas in the building? No deltas? Okay. okay. Fine. That's the first. Um, so I'll just highlight some of our key transactions. So this is actually one of my prize baby. Uh, this is a 104-unit um, development that we're doing right now in the heart of D.C., in a neighborhood where the rents are easily twice what we will be charging. Uh, this is a 108,000 square foot project, $60 million, and we utilize 4% um, um, tax credits, and it's going to actually house individuals in the 30 and 50% of AMI. And the other cool thing about this project is it is three blocks away from Union Station in D.C. So... Um, I really, really like this project, and it's unfortunate that I would not be able to reside here anytime soon. Um, this is the Delta. This is the project that we're doing with the Deltas. It's 179 senior units, 55 and over. So, this is my chance to plug this transaction. If everybody is looking for a place to live and you're 55 years and older and want to spend no more than, you know, 1,100 a month, I've got a place for you. Um, Surprisingly, this transaction was $96 million. I'm not exactly sure where all the money went, um, but so far that's the tally. And um, this is scheduled to deliver in November. And again, this is one of those cool transactions where it's, on the, it's at the intersection of H Street Corridor, Bladensburg Road, and Florida Avenue at the tip of where the streetcar is. And again, this is a neighborhood that is now rapidly unaffordable. Another baby of mine, this is the Hodge at 90-unit senior building at City Market at O, $28 million. This is my first development project in Columbia Heights, 28 units. Believe it or not, my neighbors thought I was going to devalue their property. I'm not exactly sure why they felt that way, um, because their condos were over $700,000, and they thought we were going to put a building that was going to not look as nice as theirs. And I'm happy to say my building looks way better <laughs> than their building. So uh, who's laughing now, right? So, And this building stays full, by the way. So we're very excited about this one. This was actually a partnership that we did with the district government. And this is district land. So a lot of the transactions that you see here are transactions that we've actually done where we've utilized district land for good. So we say, use your land to do good. Um, this is another district site um, at Eastern Market. So for those of you who are familiar with Eastern Market, we were actually able to create 34 new affordable units. 
what made this deal unnecessarily complicated is we were doing everything we can to appease a lot of people. So we had to bifurcate a 34 unit building into two and create one side, one wing as a senior unit and the other wing as a family unit. So you can imagine doing a site like this where you have two sources of financing, two owners, two of everything in one transaction. It was not a fun day for my attorneys, as you can imagine. So, but we got it done. So, um, this is this deal was stolen right out of Alexandra's book. So thank you to the city of Alexandria. You guys have a affordable housing building built above the fire station here in Alexandria. So we just copied and pasted and did the same thing in DC. So thank you. Um, we'll skip this one and we'll just go to. My, one of my favorite deals and the deal that um, essentially created the reason why, um, or is the reason why I have no hair today, which is the Phyllis Whitley YWCA deal. Um, this is on the corner of Rhode Island and 9th Street. So anyone who knows anything about Shaw, Shaw right now is literally the fastest growing neighborhood in the District of Columbia. Rents are astronomically high. And if I were to find a place to live there today, I would not be able to find it. But we were able to take uh, an, 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 a nonprofit that has been here for over 100 years on the brink of insolvency and try to figure out a way to preserve not their property, but also their mission. It's 84 units, $17 million of financing. And you'll be happy to know that, we'll skip, skip. For a building that small, we ended up with one, two, three, four, five, six sources of financing. So you could imagine what the day was like to make a transaction like this happen. But this is what it takes to make affordable housing possible. And luckily for us, we have very good partners in the district. And I believe it was four or five different agencies to make this deal work. Yes. So how did this work? We had a lot of partners. A lot of partners. You can imagine what the closing table was like. We obviously had operating support. Because of the mission of the property, we had to do something unique with the district whereby we had to combine local funds with federal funds to be able to create um, operating subsidy rent, whereby the residents of the building no longer have to pay rent. A lot of planning, calculated experiment, which is what this is, and a whole lot of prayer. Uh, to make the transaction work, but it's standing now. And um, yeah, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share with you all my passion for the things I love to do, and uh, I'm happy to answer questions later. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, first, uh, I'm, one, I'm excited that we thought about the schools when we're talking about affordable housing, uh, right? Because I think this is probably one of the, the most important aspects uh, of our city. I think every great city has great schools and vice versa, right? So I think that we go hand in hand. And when we talk about housing, especially with our young people who um, are being impacted by homelessness in our schools, uh, it is very important that this is definitely a key item on our agenda. So I want to talk a little bit uh, to you all first about Alexandria City Public Schools and you know a lot of times when we talk about affordable housing, our staff members uh, are not eligible for those affordable housing guidelines. So one thing that we're hoping um, as we're having these affordable housing plans uh, just like across this, you know, this country in many cities, uh, particularly urban uh, school uh, communities, uh, that there are discussions around workforce housing. Uh, where our teachers uh, can also be able to live in a community like Alexandria that, you know, the cost of living is very expensive uh, for our staff. And this is just some statistics I wanted to go over um, as I go through this presentation today. Only 37% of Alexandria City Public School employees live in the city of Alexandria. And that's a major concern for us because, you know, we have conversations around why, you know, you're not able to live here when, you know, we have such a wonderful community um, here. And, and many of them, they say, well, I can't find affordable housing for my family or even as, a, you know, as a single person uh, in, in our community. 
out of the 37 percent um, of our staff who are actually here, these are the areas uh, or the regions throughout the city of Alexandria where many of our employees live. And as you can see, most of them live on the west side uh, where they can find that most affordable housing areas. And that's over like in the Seminary Road, uh, Duke Street, South Pickett Street, um, uh, that area is where you find most of our uh, staff members living. Uh, many cannot afford to live in other parts uh, of, of our city. And this is a very a key uh, factor, you know, I think for the city to know um, is that, you know, in order for us to, to make sure that we're attracting, you know, highly qualified staff members, especially teachers, um, into Alexandria City Public Schools, this is a factor that we are definitely going to have to address um, or we're going to continue to have some challenges trying to find some of those key uh, individuals to fill those spots. So these are just some of the, the challenges that we're seeing, and I wanted to highlight uh, some of these for you all um, today. You know, specifically, not having our teachers able to live uh, in our city, it, it puts many of our families, you know, our teachers and their families, uh, in, in binds, you know. A lot of times we find uh, our staff, they live in Fairfax County or they may live in Prince William County. Some live as far as Fredericksburg, Spotsylvania, and travel here to Alexandria City Public Schools. And when we have situations like um, inclement weather and schools are closed, you know, in Northern Virginia, we're fine, but when you get past Prince William County, those buildings are closed or those schools are closed. And that causes a hardship uh, for our staff members uh, because they're closed and we're open and their children are at home. And in some cases, that requires that staff member to take off, which impacts us here um, in, in our schools. And I know these are little things that people don't think about when we, talk, when we see, you know, school is closed and everybody's excited. Some are open and some are closed, but it is definitely a hardship um, for the school division. Uh, when we think of the fact that, you know, when you have high quality teachers working in really high um, impact or highly effective school divisions, a lot of them like to work where they live. And uh, what we find is that you, and this is just what research shows, that some of your best teachers their children are a part of the school division. They live in the city that they work in. Their commute is really limited. They're not in cars all day. They're able to engage in the community activities and, and events. So uh, they're able to really um, to, to have opportunities to build relationships outside of, of their classrooms and to be a part of the culture um, of our city. And it makes it a challenge for our staff members who are not uh, living, living here. These are some of the things that we do have, though. So, you know, I, I talked about some of the challenges of uh, our staff members uh, who don't live in the city of Alexandria, but many are attracted to living here. And some of the things that we are able to work with our wonderful city um, and, and our housing authority on is making sure that we uh, share with our staff members about some of the affordable housing units that we do have uh, within the community that are for sale, uh, some of the mortgage interest rate reductions for first-time home buyers, because many of our teachers, they're first-time home home buyers in the city um, of Alexandria, uh, some of the assistance programs for first time home buyers in regards to, you know, like uh, home, I'm sorry, um, down payment assistance and closing uh, cost assistance um, and providing those opportunities for our staff members, as well as just how do you go about buying a home? And that is something that, you know, when you think of our teachers, especially our teachers who are right out of, um, out of school, they're 23, 24 years old. And it's important for us as a school division to educate them on how do you get to own a piece of America, right? And you do that by owning property and owning a home. And it is our job to provide that training. And that is uh, one of the perks that we already provide uh, many of our school divisions. Another piece I think that is very important uh, as we're talking of this topic of uh, housing is how do we have co-location with city and school facilities? And uh, right now we are in the process of building new schools in the city of Alexandria. We are at a very exciting time where our student population is continuing to grow every single year. Uh, we just opened three schools over the past year. Um, which is pretty amazing in this small little city of, of Alexandria, um, Virginia. But as we are building these new schools, it is very important for us to collaborate and to work very closely with our city 
on making sure that we have co-location services, you know, that range from affordable housing opportunities to uh, preschool in our buildings, uh, to our rec programs at our schools. Um, all of those are very important and key uh, co-location services that we are already beginning to discuss. And it is going to be a part of every time we're um, having discussions around new buildings in the city of Alexandria or for Alexandria City Public Schools, we're having that collaboration uh, with our city. This is just a quick lesson learned um, from you know, some of my experience in the past. I was superintendent in Shaker Heights uh, City Schools outside of Cleveland, Ohio. And one of the initiatives that we had uh, in place at that time was we had a lot of vacant lots throughout um, the city of Shaker Heights. And those vacant lots, we used to make them gardens and we would sell them for like a dollar to the neighbor, right? And I said, well, why don't we provide these lots for our teachers and provide programs for them to build homes and to revitalize our communities uh, that are experiencing these homes that are being dilapidated and, and torn down. And the city collaborated with the schools and we were able to start a program where uh, teachers are able to receive lots and they had financing programs to build homes and to revitalize uh, Shaker Heights, the Shaker Heights community. So these are just some really innovative approaches that I think we can bring here in the great city of Alexandria, which is also my hometown, um, to attract and retain some of the highly qualified staff members that every single one of our students deserve. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon again. My name's Nina Janabal, and I'm the president and CEO of the Arlington Partnership for Affordable Housing. We are a mission-based affordable housing group, and we work throughout the DMV. A um, little bit about us. We have 1,800 apartments today that we own and another 800 in development. Uh, and we haven't done a project yet in Alexandria, but hopefully someday soon. Um, I think it bears repeating, you heard this, those of you who are here this morning, I think it's a landmark that Metropolitan Washington COG analyze the need for housing in this community and set goals for us all. So of that, it's a huge number, 365,000 housing units needed by 2030, half of them to be affordable to people earning under 75,000 a year. It's a dramatic need. It sounds like dry data, but those are all people we know, people that work in retail, construction, housekeeping, service jobs. So this is a real need. Alexandria's master plan identified the need for 14,000 of those units. So that kind of demand needs bold solutions. I also just wanted to point out there's a lot of conversation about how to allocate your resources in terms of housing. The people who are the most rent burdened, and I know this is a complicated chart, came from um, Lisa Sturdivant, LSA Planning, who's done a lot of work in the community. But if you look at this, you can see the people that are really rent burdened. The green line shows people who are spending more than 30% of their income on their housing. The red line is people spending more than 50% of their income on housing. Well, guess what? It's dramatically higher for people earning under 35,000 a year. So as we think about resources, think about this demand, hopefully we all think about those people who have very little other resources. Why is this important? Because it helps our economy. You heard that again this morning. Um, I, I love the presentation from Audrey Davis. The legacy of racial displacement creates an uneven landscape of opportunity. And it's our job in this generation to respond to that. Beyond data, affordable housing makes good business sense, helps us with climate change, helps us with traffic. So what can we do? First, most important tool is funding. You heard this morning, a landmark change in this city was the meals tax. Doubled the amount of money for affordable housing. Very important. More important, really, for the country is the low-income housing tax credit. National program, there's legislation pending to increase that by 50%. And the local representative here, Don Beyer, is one of the co-sponsors. If that happens, that'll create significant new resources nationwide. Also, as you heard this morning, our governor is proposing a significant increase in the housing trust fund. Money is an important vehicle here, and everybody's got to participate. 
But we were here to, today to talk particularly about partnerships. Partnerships as a tool and land use is a piece of that. So how, what kind of tools do we have with land use? The biggest one is increasing density. It's important for both affordable housing and for meeting those larger COG goals, the 365,000 new units we need in the metro area. Using public land more efficiently. We just heard from the superintendent, co-location. We can't think anymore in suburban terms of one story and two story schools. How can we use the height above our civic institutions like the fire station here? Um, affordable housing bonus density, incentivizing developers to add affordable housing to their properties. And an old tool that we've tried to use, several of us are using in the industry, historic tax credits. Uh, so I want to give you some examples. These are projects that APA has developed or are under construction. These are Queens Court Apartments. And what's exciting about this is we worked with Arlington County to create more density on a one-acre site. We had 39 units in a garden apartment complex. The zoning allowed us to go up to six stories. We were at three stories. We went through a long-range planning process with the community, told the story, the data of who needs housing, the stories of who of your neighbors need housing, and we convinced the community to endorse us going to 12 stories. And, it, and one of the conversations that people had is, well, I'm not sure six stories is that different than 12 stories from my experience as a pedestrian, and it would be great if you could have some surface space for us that made us feel engaged. So we carved out a 9,000 square foot public park in the front of the building. So it was win-win. People got this experience of a surface park, and we get to house, hopefully when we open later this year, 249 affordable homes. Mm -hmm. Not too far. Um, public land. Uh, APA's done a couple of public land projects, but we have one coming up that I think is quite interesting. The County of Fairfax identified a six-acre stormwater site kind of nestled in the armpit of 495 and Van Dorn Street. Um, they solicited proposals, we responded to that, and we're, con we're putting all that stormwater in um, underground vaults and building on top of it 150 units of senior housing and surface parking. Really creative way to use an underutilized parcel, which actually, frankly, is kind of an eyesore. You know, these stormwater ponds are, are fenced off, they're not available to the public. This will be very forward-facing on Van Dorn Street, it'll connect to a pedestrian walkway. Um, we hope to open that in a, the next couple of years. We're still putting the financing together. Um, but I think that that's a, a creative way to use underutilized space as you look at your intersections, your um, roadways, under your railroad trestles. This is one of our most proud projects, and I won't talk too much because I know this is on uh, Kat's um, agenda as well, but we just opened this, this year Gilliam Place in partnership with Arlington Presbyterian Church. A hundred-year-old church that had had declining Sunday attendance, had an acre and a half of land, was looking for what is next in their mission. And they discerned from listening to the community that affordable housing was important to the community. So they worked with us and their um, hierarchical body, the National Capital Presbytery, to come up with a plan that would help them grow and be a church for the 21st century. So they're located on the first floor of this building. They have an accessible new space. They got cash from the transaction that they're using to fund their operations and their mission. And we have 173 units of affordable housing on top. And we've co-located there another nonprofit, La Cocina VA, that hopes to open later this year with a kitchen incubator that'll train low-income people in creating their own food service operations as well as getting better paying jobs in the food industry. So it's kind of a win-win-win all around. The church has a new home, we have affordable housing, and hopefully there'll be a synergy between all of us located in the same building. Uh, historic tax credits. I do want to say this with a little bit of a wince because this is a project that uh, we just completed last year. We bought 68 apartments and we used, um, there's very generous state tax credit, 25% of the amount of money you spend on renovation. Federal historic tax credits, 20%. And then we layered it with the low income housing tax credit I mentioned at the beginning. So we had a, a good solid stack of funding sources, but boy, it's really hard work renovating 1940s apartments. Um, <laughs> And, uh, I don't know if anyone here is from the state, but um, the, the historic tax credit, the historic 
Preservation Office, the SHPO, State Historic Preservation Office, was not a good friend to us. Um, they managed to, every time there was a choice between vinyl windows or um, re installing rest restored uh, wood windows, they chose the $500,000 increased cost of the wood windows. Um, so we ended up with a lot of cost overruns and it was a painful project. But historic tax credits is a tool out there and there might be an opportunity to use it and I'm happy to give anyone anyone who wants lessons learned. And this is such a historic community, I, I'm sure that this will come up as a resource. Um, we're very proud of this project. We're hoping to break ground in the next couple of months. Another civic institution that had declining membership. This was American Legion Post. Uh, they hit their zenith, like many churches actually, in the 1960s. This was the place where everybody went to, World War II vets, uh, vets from the Vietnam War, and they've just been declining r rapidly since then. They're, they're not attractive to Gulf War vets for one reason. Their building, built in the 1950s, is completely inaccessible. You have to climb up a flight of stairs or down a flight of stairs to get to their bar or their recreation room. So again, for them, we will build them a legion for the 21st century. The post will be fully accessible, 6,000 square feet, very modern, have classrooms, have training space. Um, they are thrilled about it. They will have a new post and they will have some cash to help subsidize their programs and we'll build 160 units of affordable housing on top of that, of which 50% of those will have a veteran's preference. So an important need in our community and an exciting partnership. And every time we partner, we learn a little bit more about the community and it's a way that we can do this win-win, help them to achieve and achieve the affordable housing goals. Um, just a couple of highlights from a few others in our portfolio. Uh, I won't go in any length on them, but uh, Columbia Hills, we had an existing eight acre site with existing garden apartment complex. We took a surface parking lot out of service and we put a eight story high rise on it. Doubled the number of units we have on that site. All of that is zoning. That's using density as a tool to create basically free land that helped to underwrite that project. Um, kind of similar in the springs, we had a 26 unit apartment complex. We got it rezoned. We have 104 units at that site. Arlington Mills, another one of our public-private partnerships, it's co-located with a community center. We share a parking garage, the community center's on the front on Columbia Pike, and on the back, 122 units. Um, and I just want to close with saying, you know, why do we have to innovate? Why do we need these partnerships? It's to keep our communities diverse and inclusive and to offer the American dream to the next generation so that they can live in a high-opportunity community like Alexandria. Thank you. I'm pleased to be part of a panel focused on innovative ways to realize the city's affordable housing goals. I will focus on how churches can be partners in this effort. Alexandria has a problem that makes building affordable housing difficult. It's more than 300 years old. That means there's not very much land that doesn't have something on it already. Land in the city is limited, valuable, and expensive and rarely fits into the economic model for affordable housing development. Churches in Alexandria have a problem too. Many are experiencing the national trend of declining interest in church membership. We have buildings and land holdings that may not be appropriately sized for today's congregations. Churches also have a desire to meet urgent community needs such as preschool education, food pantries, and refugee and immigrant resettlement. These community needs call for churches to constantly exercise good stewardship in the use of their physical facilities and to balance congregational needs with the needs of the broader community. Among these urgent community needs is affordable housing, and we have seen a number of churches in recent years adopt this mission, even though the time and resources required to achieve this mission are substantial. But one bright spot for churches that want to take up this mission is that there isn't just one way to do this. There are a number of different models that have been and are being used, and new churches that are considering a mission in affordable housing have several options to consider. Probably the earliest 
Church Affordable Housing Mission in Northern Virginia is the church at Clarendon. Faced with an aging congregation and a crumbling building, the church created a housing development corporation and sold not their land, but their air rights above the church. They worked out a deal with Arlington County to help finance a 10-story structure that has 60% of its units available to people who earn less than the area median income. St. James United Methodist Church took a different approach and sold their land outright to an affordable housing developer, which then built St. James Plaza with 93 units. There was a small, non-denominational church a block away, and St. James bought that building as their new home and a nearby residential property as their mission home. Arlington Presbyterian Church sold its building and land to APA, as Nina reported, to build Gilliam Place. As one church member recalls, the call to create affordable housing was bigger than the old building itself, so the walls came down. APC will be co-located with the affordable housing property. The Macedonia Baptist Church partnered with AHC to build the Macedonia, 36 affordable, housing, uh, affordable apartments across the street from the church. Fairlington Presbyterian Church was in the fortunate position of having a property large enough to be able to sell just a portion of their land to a development corporation to build 81 affordable housing units on the site while the church remains in its present location on the balance of the property. And of course, there is my own church, Church of the Resurrection, which had been located on Beauregard Street in the West End for more than 50 years. In the Episcopal Church, the diocese, headed by a bishop in Richmond, actually owns all church property. Each local congregation holds it in trust for the diocese. This meant that in addition to the extensive civic process and permissions, Resurrection also had to negotiate an ecclesiastic permission process. In 2013, our congregation began a discernment process to determine our future. Our revisioning process generated 21 possible scenarios for the future, from closing our doors, to merging with another congregation, to the most radical idea, which was to build affordable housing and a new church. At a congregation meeting, 96% of our parishioners voted in favor of this option. I frequently say that you can't get 96% agreement on which hymn to sing, sing next. <laughs> the diocese approved our vision with caveats. The property could not be sold outright, and a new church must be part of the redevelopment effort. With only a bit over two acres, we developed a plan in conjunction with AHC, our affordable housing partner, that would subdivide the property into two plots, one of which would be used to build a new smaller church, about, one about 40% of the size of our existing church. And a ground lease for 65 years would be offered to AHC to build an affordable housing building of 113 units. The entire amount of rent for the 65 years would be paid up front, and that money would then be used by resurrection to finance the building of our new church. Our church was deconsecrated at the end of October 2018. If you are a fan of do-it-yourself cable TV channels, you may have seen our church featured on an episode of Salvage Dogs, <laughs> a company that reclaims, recycles, and repurposes material from buildings that are being demolished. Groundbreaking occurred last June, and construction of the apartment building has begun. Some of uh, you may have seen that uh, on the bus tour this morning. And construction of the church will begin in March. What happens when a congregation no longer has a building, when a church doesn't have a church? During what we have come to call our time in the wilderness, we have found several ways to collaborate with others. Virginia Theological Seminary, located less than two miles from our church property, provides us with space for worship, education, and fellowship. Our church offices are in the basement of a faculty residence on the campus. Emmanuel Church on the Hill shares its worship and fellowship space with us, and we have held a number of joint services. 
Our food pantry has been relocated to the mission house of St. James Methodist Church, which along with two other church, churches augments resurrection parishioners in staffing the food pantry. Our preschool of more than 40 years has merged with the one at Fairlington Methodist Church. And the Church of St. Clement allows us to use their parish hall for monthly fellowship meetings, such as potluck suppers and game nights. Our Boy Scout and Girl Scout troops also meet there. So what lessons can Resurrection share with other churches that are considering a housing mission? This is an extraordinarily complex and difficult mission to achieve, so be sure to invest the time to discern the con congregational will. Even though we started out with 96% of our parishioners supporting the mission, we have lost members, and we have had periods of discouragement and self-doubt. Recognize that consensus takes time. We decided to do this in 2013. We hope to hold our first service, service on Easter Sunday, 2021. Choose your partners wisely. We were fortunate in finding AHC, an experienced affordable housing developer, who understood that for us, this, this was not just another housing project. This was a calling, a vision, a mission. Also, the Alexandria Office of Housing has been very helpful, and we have had advice from several other members of this panel. And all of those collaborative partners I mentioned a few minutes ago, none of them is charging us rent for any of our activities. Be flexible. What we are getting bears little resemblance to our initial vision. And don't expect your neighbors to be as enthusiastic about your mission as you are. When this happens, we just repeat our church mantra to ourselves. God provides everything to do what God calls us to do. I think you'll agree these were really inspirational and uplifting stories. And in this work that we do, um, it's hard. I'm not going to lie. Many of you know that. So it's really, really important that we celebrate um, success stories, um, that we see the pictures, and we learn about the progress that has been made. But as we know, there's so much more to do. So before I open it up for questions, I'd like you to join me in thanking our panel for being here today. We do have microphones uh, here in the front. We have a few minutes for questions. Is there anyone who has a question? Yes, please. You can come up to the mic if you don't mind. If you know you have a question, come on up. My question is for Nina. Can you hear me? Yeah. Is is her mic on? Okay. Okay. Um, if you speak into the mic, oh, please. I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay. There you go. So um, I noticed on your slide that the second highest group of people who are in need of housing were under twenty thousand dollars. What's being done for to address these this group of people? Um, sure. You want me to repeat the question, uh, make sure I understand it. The highest need is for people earning under 35000 a year. Yes, absolutely. So, um, and, the, then you, oh, I'm sorry. and then on your slide, it shows the second highest was actually under 20000 mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the area I'm asking about, the under 20000 because that's a very high number also. And it seems like that's the area that's not being addressed by affordable housing. Yep, good question. Uh, so those of us who do low-income housing, tax credit housing, often work closely with the subsidy programs in the community. So for example, the Section 8 program, the federal Section 8 program, has limits on the amount of rent it can pay. So the more we build the affordable housing at the 60% of area median income, you saw the charts at the beginning of today, those are units that are available to voucher holders. Not all private apartments are available to voucher holders anymore as the rents have gone up. 
The other thing we advocate for in the communities we work in is local housing subsidies. Montgomery County has one, DC has one, Arlington has one. So they can layer in, again, a local rent subsidy with the low income housing tax credit rents. Uh, another piece of this is a, a renewed focus, this is happening nationwide, on rebuilding our public housing. And you heard again this morning, ARHA's plans, and this is an important piece of it. They serve the very <coughs> low income, the zero to 30%, and I think we're gonna see more resources coming from the state and municipalities to support their work. So I think there are a couple ways we're addressing it. It's very hard. I should say there's also an initiative happening right now in Arlington with the Arlington Community Foundation where they're trying to raise private philanthropic money to address this population. They're calling it Shared Prosperity. It's a national initiative run by the Kresge Foundation to really address that low income. So it's a huge challenge and it's very hard to serve because some of them that those households need a rent that's lower than the cost of operating those buildings. So it, it really needs to be subsidized. Thank you for asking. Any other questions? I think to add what, what Nina, um, when she spoke about the subsidies, we certainly need at all levels of government participation in addressing housing for extremely low income households. And that means um, more money for the housing choice voucher, which is the section eight program that is funded at the federal level. Um, there is a national housing trust fund that is given to each of the states. In Virginia, it's a relatively small amount of money. Uh, I think it's up to about $6 million, which is not a lot of money for the statewide needs, but it is um, focused specifically on serving people at 30% of the area median income. Uh, and the city of Alexandria does have a very small um, rental subsidy program. It's a pilot program where they are beginning to try to um, address needs and buy rents down for those people at extremely low incomes. But that there are many people who work in our community who are vital to our community who are in those low income ranges who really, really struggle for housing. Yes. Thank you. That was um, Mary Hines, who is a former Arlington County uh, chair and board member. Thank you, Mary, for being here and for raising this issue. The governor has proposed a significant increase in resources for the state housing trust fund, going from approximately 11 million a year to almost 30 million, and then in the second budget year, 40 million. This will make a big difference. Um, in helping us in high cost areas like Northern Virginia address uh, our housing needs um, and help create that lasagna of subsidy that um, Bua talked about. I call it the lasagna because it's very visual, very easy to understand, right? All of the layers that you need to make housing, uh, housing affordable, especially as we try to eat, reach people at the lower income levels. So the State Housing Trust Fund there is also a bill which is very important and has not um, gained approval for many years, which is to make source of income, meaning if you have a voucher and you go to a, an apartment owner and say, I would like to use my voucher as part of my payment for um, my rent, they are under no obligation to accept your voucher. And that is a real barrier to... Uh, to providing more housing resources and subsidy um, for people who need affordable housing. Um, so far, we have not been able to get that passed in the state of Virginia. We should also note that Senator Tim Kaine has introduced that at the national level. Uh, I don't believe that bill went anywhere. So that's another area. There are areas of advocacy that we can be engaged in uh, to push people, uh, to push our, our elected officials and our decision makers to open up and be more flexible on the resources that, that we need to accomplish this work. And we have someone here. Thank you for your patience. I guess this is for Nina. Is there any interest or potential in repurposing declining shopping centers for affordable housing? 
Um, I can answer that, but I, there might be others that have opinions on it too. Fairfax County just made a dramatic reduction in the number of parking spaces required in shopping centers with the specific goal of helping to see revitalization. It was not targeted to affordable housing. Something we need to work on is whenever those kind of things happen to make sure there's an affordable housing component or requirement in it. Um, but I definitely think that's a trend. I don't know if you've heard anything about this. I do think looking at our obsolete land uses, not only um, older strip malls, um, older office buildings, look at these land uses that are no longer applicable and how we can repurpose, redevelop, uh, redesign. There are a lot of challenges to doing that, um, not only the land use and zoning, but also the current owners, um, how financing would be structured, um, there are many challenges, but local governments are beginning to look at that. I, I loved the message that Andrea gave us uh, this morning about don't be afraid to do a pilot, to try something new and innovative, because if you wait to carry it through an exhaustive approval process, uh, the market may have changed and you may have lost your opportunity. So, Any other questions? Yes. I, uh, I work at the Animal Welfare League of Alexandria. I'm here uh, representing them today. Get closer. Oh, sorry. Yep. There you go. Um, we feel very strongly that every family, you know, regardless of income, should have the opportunity to have the companionship of a, of a pet if they choose. And we deal with a lot of people who um, we either have to uh, give up a pet that they, they can't have because of housing uh, restrictions um, or we're housing their pet as they're facing homelessness and potentially turning down places they could afford because they will not allow them to bring their pet. Um, a lot of these projects that you all are talking about has that been considered? Are there pet policies? Are, are they pet friendly? Are there policies that have been considered in that um, to include the, the whole family? Um, well, I'll try and answer that, but uh, I'm not an expert in this. As far as I understand, there's no financing barriers to having pets on site. Certainly some people think about it, some, some landlords think about it as a convenience issue. Pets can be um, more challenging. Several of our properties do allow pets, and um, as a person who just committed to my husband, his Christmas gift was to get a dog back in our life. I'm thinking, <laughs> I guess that's a little hypocritical if, you know, I, again, it's an equity issue, right? If I, as a single family homeowner, can just make that decision, but a, a tenant cannot. So I, I think you raise a really good question. So uh, keep raising that issue and, and, and potentially what we need though is also people to support our families, right? Because often there are extra charges related to that. So making sure that they have the support to do it, but a really good question. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm Rolf Blank. Um, my question... Get closer to the mic, please. Closer. My question is about, uh, for anyone, about repurposing or using existing space, such as the church example, um, and how do you... How, what has been your experience about dealing with neighbors in terms of increasing density, about traffic, about oh, we're going to be overwhelmed by all of these kinds of things. What, is, what has been your experience and how to address those, those issues? He opened the Pandora's box. I, I thought there was a small, <laughs> Thank you. A small topic. Yeah. <laughs> Who wants to take that? Uh, I'll take a stab. Can you guys hear me? Yes, you okay. just have to so, get close. You're talking to someone who is uh, currently embroiled in the lawsuit right now. Um, just because of NIMBYism, there's no reason for it. It's delayed the delivery of approximately almost 300 units in a prominent location in D.C. Um, and, you know, we had a court hearing last February uh, on Valentine's Day, and we're still waiting to hear back from, from the courts as far as that's concerned. Um, prior to that, I was also involved in two other lawsuits on two separate projects, uh, one in Capitol Hill um, and another one in the West End. Uh, we obviously prevailed, but those also delayed the delivery of the projects by approximately two years. Um, and in those two instances, no different than the other project that I'm currently involved in a lawsuit, I can tell you that we had no less than 100 community meetings. So, um, so it's not 
for it's not of lack of of communicating. I think we may have over communicated. As a matter of fact, um, however, you know, it's just part of the process, which is going back to the point that you made earlier is is revisiting our you know very uh, archaic um, comprehensive zoning laws to figure out ways in which we don't find ourselves being embroiled in lawsuits that end up costing us you know hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars and delay the delivery of the project so you know um, you know we, we as a company have a policy to engage every single one of our neighbors every transaction that I've worked on to date uh, we've been good neighbors and we continue to do just that However, there are just some neighborhoods that, um, you know, they hear the word affordable housing and, you know, they they start to think of, you know, any and everything humanly possible to ensure that that does not happen. So it's unfortunate. Yes. curious and on, um, you mentioned that you guys have three newly um, schools that, that was built. Are they renovated schools or are they, how does that go? Is that this, the three that you were speaking upon, are they from renovations and just reopened or are yes, they so new founded um, schools? So they're all a uh, modernization of schools in one new school. So Ferdinand T. Day is a, is a new school, but it was an office building that was um, renovated into an actual elementary school, a six-story office building, and that is how you're repurposing space. Uh, the other school was Patrick Henry Elementary School, which is now a pre-K-8 school, um, and it was a new structure that was built right next door to the old Patrick Henry. Um, and then the third location is at John Adams, our early childhood center, um, which is a part of John Adams Elementary School, and that was an addition uh, as a part of the current John Adams Elementary School, now there is a preschool uh, center that was built um, that opened this past year as well. Okay, so you said um, at the old, the new school is next to the old Patrick Henry. Yes. Do y'all plan on doing anything like extending it for the workforce affordability housing? So no, so what we're using the old uh, Patrick Henry School for now is actually swing space for Douglas MacArthur School, while we're, we will begin rebuilding that uh, starting this summer. Um, so that's gonna be a swing space for the next two years, and that's gonna be torn down and become fields for, um, soccer fields for Patrick Henry. Um, so what we're looking at is all of our future um, modernizations that are gonna occur, like Douglas MacArthur, um, the high school project, so we're gonna be building a structure at Minnie Howard, the Minnie Howard site. Um, Core Kelly is another school, and George Mason is another school over the next 10 years that we're going to be rebuilding. And those are conversations that we're having with the city around uh, what are co-location opportunities that we can have, including affordable housing and all the other types of co-location services. Okay, and this is my last um, <laughs> inquiry, you know. Um, so I was just curious as well, when you say that climate weather causes a lack of um, the professional teachers being available, would that also include just in general, are you guys like having voids with um, filling the teachers' uh, positions? Um, so really, it, it impacts all employees and not just teachers um, because, you know, if we, our, our staff members, um, so when I say staff, I'm referring to bus drivers, um, custodians, right. uh, you know, people who work in central office, um, our building engineers. Uh, so really, all of our staff members are impacted when we have situations in Northern Virginia where a lot of the Northern Virginia schools are open, but when you get past Prince William County, um, some of those school divisions are closed. Uh, that's when we typically see call-ins for people not being able to come into work because they're home, uh, because their children are not at school that particular day. Uh, and that's when we have those, those issues. And that's more than just teachers. It's really all of our staff members who are impacted by that. Thank you. I thank appreciate you. your work, Dr. Hyde. Uh, thank you. Thank you all. Um, I see I'm getting the high sign that people from the next session are moving in. So thank you all so much for your participation. We appreciate you being here today. The next session is starting at 2.15.